Hello, um, my name is Elspeth Pitt. I'm Senior Curator of Australian Art at the National Gallery here in Canberra, also known as Canberra. I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri, their elders past, present and emerging, and also to acknowledge that creative practice has occurred on this country since time immemorial. I'm really honoured to be here tonight with Judy Watson and Helen Johnson, two artists I admire deeply. Um, and just a little introduction, Judy is a Wanyi woman based in Mianjin, also known as Brisbane, and Helen, a second generation immigrant of Anglo descent living in Nam, otherwise known as Melbourne. Judy and Helen's exhibition, of which you can sort of see some footage at the moment, The Red Thread of History, Loose Ends, is one that considers the historical and ongoing impacts of colonisation, particularly as they relate to women. Matrilineal histories are key to Watson's work, while Johnson's work explores the symbolism of women and whiteness in historical illustration and contemporary media alike. Their works were commissioned by the National Gallery with the assistance of the Balnaves Foundation, and we'd all like to acknowledge the vision and the generosity of Neil Balnaves, who passed away just as this exhibition opened. Tonight, we were also supposed to have been joined by our dear colleague and friend, uh, Cara Kirkwood, Head of First Nations Engagement here at the National Gallery. Cara, unfortunately, is unwell and is no longer able to join us, but she kindly pre-recorded an introduction uh, earlier this morning while she was sort of still feeling okay, so we'll cut to her shortly. But before we do that, um, I'll just let everyone know, as Justin has mentioned to the audience here, that we're using the Slido app tonight to take questions from the audience. Um, I think the details will come up on the screen shortly and um, not that we expect otherwise but we know that all questions asked will be respectful of the artists, their practices and of cultural reconciliation more broadly. Um, so Justin maybe we can go to Cara's intro. Thank you. Hi everybody, good evening and welcome to the National Gallery's National Reconciliation Week event. Um, I am co-piloting remotely today on the beautiful, very cold lands of the Ngunnawal people in a suburb of Cambry, what I'm deeming now as COVID land. I would be joining the lovely uh, uh, Elspeth Pitt this evening, um, but I do have uh, COVID in isolation. Um, a big shout out to Judy, who's one of my favourite people um, at this Reconciliation Week. I'm also standing in front of my favourite painting by the lovely Karen Mills. Millsy, if you're watching from Northern Territory, get a. I hope you're having a good Reconciliation Week as well. Um, tonight is very special. We are focusing on an exhibition uh, through the In Conversation with uh, Judy and Helen, which I will hand over to Elspeth in a moment. But I just wanted to take a moment to let you know about a few things from the National Gallery's perspective. And that this week in National Reconciliation Week is a really important week. In fact, we've seen many things happen. Um, we've had a massive um, ceremony yesterday with our really important work being centered in the heart and pulse of the gallery in the Aboriginal Memorial Poles. Um, and shout out to the Raman Ginning community who have traveled all the way here to sing those polls in for us. I, from all accounts, um, it was really spectacular and really special, so thank you. Uh, Linda Burney become the first Aboriginal woman to ever hold a ministerial portfolio. Congratulations, Linda. Um, this year's theme, of course, is Be Brave, Make Change. Um, it's really important, I think, to recognise a couple of landmarks. In fact, how National Reconciliation came about um, is from the 67 referendum happening on the 27th of May in 1967 um, and the Mabo decision on June 3rd, 1992, which gives us these coordinates for the week. Um, you know, the last time, that is the last time we've had a, a major referendum and I, I guess under the theme and aligning uh, referendums, it's very interesting to think that under the banner of being brave and making change, we may well see ourselves have another referendum um, in, in the coming uh, years, in fact. So that's very exciting. Um, the other things I wanted to talk about was quickly with the NGAs, uh, the National Gallery's um, reconciliation journey. We've got a couple of big um, marked 
events going on at the moment. And one of them is the ever present exhibition, which is a partnership with our Indigenous arts partner, West Farmers Arts. Thank you very much. Um, we have ever present uh, currently being shown in Singapore National Gallery. And I must say, um, Judy, your work is out on the front banner, out on in the front of the gallery. I think I sent you a text photo of that. Um, and it's really exciting for that to be there. I know Tina Baum, who uh, I was replacing here tonight, um, strangely, we're both remote, uh, is traveling over to Venice at the moment. But thank you, Tina, who has been over there for some time actually co-curating and there's been a lot of cross-cultural exchange uh, in that context about how First Nations culture is being viewed outside of Australia. It's really important. Um, I think that we've also, before I go, we do also have, uh, speaking of West Farmers as our National Indigenous Arts Partner, we have the West, West Farmers National Gallery Indigenous Arts Leadership program currently, I imagine right about now, uh, having canapes and some nice drinks down the stairs in the room, but that has been a very um, fruitful program for us over the last 12 years. We've seen now what might be around 120 alumni of that program, and that, I can't tell you, um, having uh, experience with that program, we've had a lot of um, I guess the best way to say this is it's really building the um, arts, culture and creativity ecology for this country. That program's got some very serious, awesome alumni in it. So if you're in the audience, alumni people, get ATU too. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you now, Elspeth. Thank you, um, my co-pilot. I'm sorry I can't be there, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful night. Thanks. Thanks, Cara. Um... And it's also, maybe we'll do this later, but it's actually Cara's birthday today too, so um, she's in isolation and maybe we'll send her a little message afterward. Um, but Judy and Helen, before we begin, for our blind and low vision audiences at, at home and online, could you briefly self-describe? Judy, would you go first? Sounds like self-destruct. <laughs> I also want to acknowledge our traditional owners of this country and it was lovely just recently seeing Aunty Matilda House just up at the IATSIS conference. So my name is Judy Watson, I'm an artist and a one-year woman, um, mother, daughter, many things, currently living in Brisbane and our country is Northwest Queensland and the Gulf, Gulf of Carpentaria, cut by the Northern Territory border. Hi, I'm Helen Johnson. Um, also many things, I suppose. Um, a mother, a daughter, um, an artist, training to be an art therapist. Um, to self-describe um, physically, I'm pretty short, five foot two. I've got short curly hair that's brown and brown eyes and fair skin. I'm wearing like rust coloured jumper and shoes and black skirt and tights because it's freezing here in Canberra. Very cold in Canberra today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the elders of this country and pay my respects. Um, and finally, I'm Elspeth, as I've said. Um, I'm pale skinned, I have brown hair, green eyes, and I'm wearing a, a dress made out of recycled materials in a kind of patchwork manner. Um, so anyway, we'll get to the, the meaty stuff now, which is your work and your amazing exhibition. Um, so I think just to kick off, I want to acknowledge that the works in the exhibition, which I hope you've had an opportunity to see upstairs, they're two distinct bodies of work that have come together within that space, and yet they were made in relation to each other. You spoke to each other during the making of the works over the course of about a year. Um, but I want to ask first about the title, which is something that you arrived at together, the red thread of history, Loose Ends. Could you speak to the significance of that title and kind of its manifold meanings. And Judy, perhaps you could start us off. Thank you. Uh, yes, I've, I've heard of that uh, term and read about it 
by Ernest uh, Rechner, and he talks about the red thread of history being ochre, and that ochre is at the beginning of every civilization around the world. You'll find it at the, the burials, um, the births, you know, early painting, etc. And I know that in our country, um, ancestors' bones would be ochred, wrap, wrapped in bark, placed in chambers with stones on top. And I spoke to Helen about the Henry Parks um, quote that I had read coming down through, I'm not even sure if it was um, Parks, I guess, um, you know, with the, the crimson thread. So maybe you can talk about that aspect, Helen. Sure. Um, yeah, so Henry Parks, if anyone's not aware of um, the person for whom this suburb is named, I believe, um, he was the New South Wales Premier um, and um, was very instrumental in federation um, of the states of this continent into so-called Australia. Um, and he gave an oration in the, eight, I think, 1889 that sort of led to the process of federation and in that he used this image of the crimson thread of history um, which was a his articulation of the white supremacist project that, of you know, a bloodline. Yeah, yeah. That, all, that all these pure white races are, you know, um, uniting to prosper. Mm. Um, when you know, obviously, we know that that was a yeah egregious piece of propaganda. Um, so we, yeah, we thought it was pretty interesting to bring these two different ideas of that red thread into play with each other, particularly given our different subject positions. Thank you. And I guess um, it's like, a, in a way, it's such a succinct and modest image, but one that's kind of very rich and, as you say, speaks to these very different subject positions. But nonetheless, I, I think, you know, it's really apparent when you kind of walk through the show, that there are these material and conceptual resonances between your works. So I'd love to kind of maybe hear a little bit, a little bit about that, and maybe you could speak to some specific works as well. Sure. Will we have images coming up? Yes. Yeah. yes. Great. Yeah. So this work here um, was made in connection with uh, deaths in custody and it doesn't feature all of the deaths in custody uh, that have happened or occurred throughout Australia. I know that my great aunt, for example, is not there but she certainly died in custody after being sent to um, Palm Island and then uh, brought back to uh, Mount Isa Detention Centre. But these are just some of the names which have been allowed to be released to the, the public um, by the families of um, deaths in custody and um, these came through The Guardian. So you can see uh, there's the names, um, the names that are allowed to be um, sort of reproduced and then there is muslin cloth um, which has been sewn by... Um, friends and family, um, anybody who want to come and collaborate. And I like the idea of, I, I painted the welt wounds and um, just pinned them to the muslin cloth itself and then asked people to come in and they were stitched with linen thread, waxed linen thread. And you can see the threads hanging down too. And I was wanting, uh, as people were stitching, we were having a great time stitching together, but to also reflect on this, and think about as the needle goes in, it's the idea of to pierce, and then as it comes back around again, it's to repair. So that whole thing of sort of the stitching being a healing process in itself, but also something that we were doing together. So at one stage, I had a whole lot of um, people I'd invited, women in fact, um, to come, and um, we had the muslin cloth stretched across a table, and um, people were on either side of it, stitching and it was a really great thing and I got my son to um, you know make the food for us and it was something where we could 
speak across generations of different histories and different experiences. And there was young one, one young woman who was working uh, supporting refugees and uh, somebody else at the other end of the spectrum doing something else. So it's a way of like a stitching circle, mm. but once again, piercing and repairing. Yeah, so community driven, um, but also, I mean, that's one thing that, you know, is really evident in both of your work, this sort of um, archival practice, uh, this, uh, I guess, bringing to light these lesser known histories that we all sort of like need to know, but don't necessarily hear enough about. Um, but I guess, you know, also materially, you both tend to work uh, at scale, often with um, sort of material. Um, you've said this really beautiful thing in the past, uh, Judy, about this kind of tender stamp of femininity, which I think is also evident in this kind of sewing, and again, this idea of the thread. I wonder, Helen, if you want to kind of pick up at this point and, and maybe speak to some of your work in the show. Sure. Um, I guess I, um, I construct a lot of my works by creating surfaces and then masking them out with with different gauges of masking tape, sort of. Um, so it's almost like you put down a layer of paint and then you preserve some of that layer by masking it and then obliterate the rest of it with another layer until you've built up this... Um, it's almost like a palimpsest, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of which you sort of the painting becomes like this blind surface and you can only see what's the, the uppermost layer which is often a thick kind of molding paste layer and then it's a process of pulling the tape out of that layer i think in sign writing they call it weeding mm -hmm. weeding out the vinyl and it's mm -hmm. it feels like that you have to sort of dig into the surface sometimes with mm -hmm. sharp objects to to get to where the tape is buried and then these um, these different registers of image emerge and intersect with each other in these ways that I find, particularly if I'm dealing with archival material, that's for the images to be able to interfere with each other and make each other incoherent, I think is a, it's a useful way of approaching particularly the sort of histories that I've received through my education as a white person in this country where you're fed these sort of coherent nationalist narratives about colonisation and mm. how it supposedly worked and, you know, then you... Speak up. Oh, apologies. Is that better? Thank you. Sorry, I do have a tendency to... We're both softly ..to drift spoken. into quiet. Please, um prompt me if I fade away again. <laughs> um, now I need to reconnect with my train of thought. Um, yeah, I guess, yeah, using these material processes as a way of thinking about disrupting those supposedly coherent narratives mm -hmm. and thinking about... We were talking earlier about this, about encouraging people to do their own digging as well, you know, realising at certain points in your life, it's, well, this is something that I've done in any case, that you know very little and it's time to go and start educating yourself and mm. that's a long process. Yeah, well, I think that kind of leads to, to my next question. Um, in a prior interview with Tina Baum, who with Jacqueline Babington were really instrumental in, in working with Judy and Helen sort of on this project, which has been a long time in the works and was one delayed many times by COVID, um, as we're sort of all sort of used to now. But Helen, you kind of cite in this interview uh, with Tina something that Judy said during one of your first kind of conversations. Um, which became a touchstone for you. And Judy, your statement was, it's a shared history and no one gets away with it. So Helen, which is such a great, a great statement, a really loaded one. So I wanted to ask, Helen, why did that become so important to you? And Judy, you know, what do you see as kind of like the full implication of that, that statement? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, 
I guess I, you know, I've, I've made quite a lot of work that seeks to address these colonial continuities and legacies and histories f from my position um, as a white woman and I feel like that's always really complex because it's, I, I feel, you know, it's not, it's not for me to address Indigenous stories and histories and content in my artwork. Um, so for me, it has to be a conversation. And if I'm going to address this, you know, dig back into the archives of how the colony that I'm a part of has developed and established itself and continued to assert itself mm. and continued to do damage, that that should be um, undertaken alongside the voices of Indigenous artists who are working, you know, through their own stories and histories. Um, yeah, and, you know, I'm sure there are people who would differ that, about that and um, it's a big conversation. But, yeah, that's something that, I've, that I think about. Yeah. And Judy? Well, I just um, think it's important to know uh, more about the history of the place you're living on and working on and travelling on and visiting. And so for me perfectly, uh, if I'm sort of uh, here in parts of Australia, it's not my country, but I want to know about it and I want to know those histories. And the same if I'm travelling overseas, I want to know the earliest history first and then uh, build up from there. And to me, that's the way to make sense of yourself. And when I talked about it's a shared history and nobody gets away with it, I think that's true. I think we all have a responsibility to know about this place and about um, not just our impact on it, but previous um, ancestors or histories impact upon it and try and do something about it. Um, I really believe in the power of people to change uh, what's happening. And I really hope for my children's and, you know, future generations' sake that um, all of us actually make a stand, learn about those histories, do something about it and pass it on. Yeah, thank you. And maybe just can you comment on this because this is something that I, I have felt myself... Um, sort of walking through the show, and again, this kind of speaks to the the material and the conceptual concerns that you, perhaps you share. But the fact that you know these aren't kind of solid objects or 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 paintings, um, sort of like framed on canvas, they're not static. And so, as a as a member of the public, sort of walking walking through them, you kind of animate them, and you feel implicated in the kind of histories and the memories that they're kind of referring to is is that something that you're kind of conscious of or yeah uh, I've always loved the way that um, the textiles or you know the works on canvas I love having that the torn edge of it and the way it moves and ripples and it is animated and I think you know even the shadows on it and you know people have asked why do I use the torn edges and it's because enables your gaze to move beyond it. There's something about that. Mm. And I think that the way it's set up at the moment, it's, it is it is maze-like mm. and people can walk through and then come out and uh, see, you know, those ripples of history and experience. Um, like an osmosis, you know, coming back and forth between mm. the artist and the viewer and experiencing it like this. I think, I think it's pretty exciting. It's better than going to the show. <laughs> um, I also think that um, when the work is free hanging and the bodies of the people in the space are part of the conversation, mm -hmm. it also means that depending where you are in the room, you have a whole different set of imagery in your line of sight. Mm. So it's like all of the surfaces and the content of the room are talking to each other at the same time mm. in a way that's more complicated than just like a linear mm. experience of 
of an artwork. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess in that respect, I'd also like to ask, you know, how the works inform each other. And in fact, like, do they always inform each other? Because that's something you've also spoken about in the past. You know, sometimes the works are at odds with, with each other. Um, Judy, did you want to start? Well, I think um, we've got different histories and different stories that we bring to this. But in a way, it does go back and forth, the same as you, you're sort of reading it um, and reflecting from one perspective to the other. So with my work, I'm uh, thinking about, and this really came from the conversation of what the work was going to be about um, and what, Helen, the sort of work that you were making. And I thought, OK, if we're looking at colonisation, history, women, I want to look at the women in my family. And that's where I started working with the idea of the the maps and the silhouettes, and the maps are maps of um, country that our family are from and stations they've worked on, and then the silhouettes, except for the one of... Um, so this is my mother, Joyce, on the, the left here at the moment, and it's the pastoral uh, tenure map, and a lot of those stations are places our family, both my um, matrilineal and, um, you know, sort of other ancestors have worked on those properties and mum grew up on one. My grandmother was born on Riversley Station, um, you know, and was taken away with her, her mother, Mabel Daly, um, taking my grandmother, Grace Isaacson, running away from the station in the middle of the night because of many things, including police used to take the kids away. Uh, there, were, uh, there was violence on the station. And so my grandmother remembers you know, she was five or six years old. And like rabbit proof friends, basically they're running their, um, you know, Mabel, her mother had a little baby, Daisy, and there was um, Grace's little brother, Paddy, and they were uh, following rivers and creeks. And my grandmother said that her mother would catch fish uh, to sustain them. And she would give us as in my grandmother and the rest of the family, the flesh off the backbone, the best of what she had. So there's all those stories that come through that then I, I guess, remember and utilise as an artist to try and convey some of those stories uh, within my work. So, yeah, this is my mother's profile and she actually said she wanted to be, to be on the, um, the Walter Roth map, which if you look at it says, um, you know, that the blacks are wild and not to be trusted in this part and all of this sort of thing. And she really wanted to be the sort of, you know, blacks not to be trusted one. But it, I just said, no, sorry, it just didn't fit. But uh, I think when you look at the um, the shape of almost like the sheet within it, it's also showing that sort of the shadow um, silhouette style of um, ethnographic photography. So it's it's got, you know, all sorts of things within it and it's charged with meaning apart from just being a map. Mm. Yeah. Helen? Um, I guess I... Just going back to what you were saying about the there being a sense of the works being at odds, I think for me, like, thinking about Judy's stories and the stories of her family and survival, my relation to this place is so different and so shallow. Like, my parents came here in 1975 as, like, aspirational mm. economic migrants from the UK. And, um, you know, I was born here, like, four years after that. So it's a really different way of inhabiting this place. And I think that that disconnection from this place is reflected in the work as well. And I also think um, the, like the materiality of the work in the space, it's like it's very clear that it's two distinct bodies of work. And even though my work has been conceived of as, you know, as these sort of through spaces, they're also, they also become like this monolith in the middle of the room that's like such a white woman thing to do <laughs> in a way. And I think that 
I actually think it's important to um, acknowledge those things when they occur and, um, you know, address your own positions of ignorance and your own positions of entitlement mm. in, a, in a position such as mine um, as part of the discomfort, you know, that it's not... that thinking about the rifts that are in existence in this place, in these places, there are a lot of people, I think, who are like, just put that in the too hard basket. I don't, it's too challenging. And I think it's really important actually to look at those challenges and feel that awkwardness and, you know, keep pushing through it. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think maybe just kind of following on from this, Judy, you've kind of touched on this in, in terms of speaking about the work, um, which includes your mother, Joyce. Mm. But as we kind of touched on in the introduction, you know, a focus of these works, um, you know, is women uh, or, you know, other women in your lives in kind of various um, ways and capacities. So could you speak a little bit more to that? Because um, one of the interesting things, I think, Helen, particularly about uh, one of my kind of favourite works in the show, The Birth of an Institution, is what you were kind of talking about as a, as a white woman myself. Um, women have often been kind of victims, I guess, of colonial or patriarchal structures, but they're also complicit. So did you want to maybe kind of speak to that a little bit? Yep. Um, so I guess I was thinking with this body of work, like I've made works dealing with this sort of archival material in the past that tends to become really male-focused because a lot of the imagery from around Nam, where I live, which was colonised in 1838, I think was the sort of moment. Um, it's very male-dominated imagery and it's easy to sort of just go look at, the, look at all the evil ruling class white men. But, you know, you also got to remember that, you know, the old adage of, like, behind every powerful man there's a powerful woman. Um, and, you know, that's not to generalise and go, oh, women had a great time, at, you know, in that context. I'm sure they didn't. But um, I was interested to sort of, with this work, to sort of flip the script and and just ask, like, what does it look like if this institutional space is repositioned so it's like emerging from a woman's body. Um, so the, the sort of um, liquid lines of, the, of an architectural blueprint in this painting are um, adapted from the blueprint of the State Library of Victoria, which was a, um, yeah, here it is. Um, so this building was um, erected in the 1850s and I guess I think about this as a, um, you know, I didn't want to like particularly pick on the library but just identifying it as a, I think of it as like the colony was starting to get its molars when it was building these big mm. institutional buildings and yeah, just thinking about the idea of that dome on the top of that building ends up being what is crowning that, you know, is about to be pushed out from this woman's body, but it also becomes a mechanism to talk about um, just all the lines of influence and power that go into the, those colonial processes and the roles that both men and women play in them. At the time, I was reading Richard Broom's um, Coburg Between Two Creeks, which is a history of... A, a, Northern, in a northern suburb of mm. Melbourne that, that was once a farm village. And um, in that painting, the, these figures that are surrounding the, the labouring woman come from reading this history of the processes where it's like arriving in an area, the division of property, mm. the erection of a school and a church to, you know, it's like the control of information really central and, and comes first and then you know everything else sort of falls into place after that the land continues to be divided 
now we're, you know, buying tiny one-bedroom apartments for $800,000 and it's still part of the same process. Yeah. So, yeah, the figures around the edge are sort of like the, the priest, the policeman, the father, who's also the banker, the midwife, the teacher. Um, yeah, so just, just trying to lay that, lay that out and think about mm. the deliberacy of those structures. Yeah. And Judy, did you want to say anything more about kind of the matrilineal kind of aspect? Because, I mean, I think it's so striking when you walk into that space and you kind of encounter Joyce. She's really kind of the first work that you see. And then just down that sort of through line across or sort of like down the space, just this sort of succession of women. Um, did you want to say something to that? Yeah, I think it just... Um it just was a bit of a stumbling of, you know, starting to make work and then think about it. And I had used silhouettes before. And in fact, I was uh, talking with both of you previously about uh, a project that I did. It was called Songs for Jefferson. And it was, I had um, silhouettes facing each other. And one at the University of Virginia was I had uh, Walter, who was the cleaner, facing off with uh, another guy who was the head of the art school. And that whole idea of facing off with people of um, different economic backgrounds or different stratas in society, and thinking about institutions and where who has who has the most you know sort of power. And I actually think that Walter is a cleaner with the keys probably has more power <laughs> than his uh, supposed adversary is on top of the art school. But um, that's where I sort of was thinking, and so I. Um, that's where the portrait of me comes in. That was one of the songs for Jefferson, you know, sort of so that's projects the that I did. Work, yeah? The that's second the work, yeah. That's that's myself, yeah. with a climate change graph and um, vegetation that I'd picked up during COVID times, and the the bale of shell, which I've used a lot as a bit of a metaphor for um, my matrilineal family, because the bale of shell was used as a drinking vessel. It's often found. Um, at waterholes that are inland. It's something that's very female form. It's used uh, as a vessel for ochre, painting up water, etc. Then my daughter Rani is further along and she's a bit like Lady Justice and uh, with the, the freshwater mussel shells. Then my sister Lisa uh, with the tenure map again. Yeah, that there's Rani with the freshwater mussel shells and they're sort of almost like the, la I call it the Lady Justice with the, um, the hoop pine coming down across her, her face. And Lisa with the kangaroo grass and the dugong bones, rib bones coming through. Um, and then the next one, oh, maybe it's not there further along. Anyway, it sort of, it just goes down. Then my cousin Dot who, does Shibori work with me, and that's my non-Aboriginal side, and then Ebony, who's um, my art assistant in the studio, there's Dot. So it's just that sort of whole idea. I didn't really know where it was going to go to, but, uh, and Ebony's got, once again, um, a chart, you know, sort of a talking about climate change or talking about various things that are affecting us. And uh, then if we... At some stage, I'd like to talk about the Carpentaria petition. Yes, yeah, Is that on. okay? Yeah, this one here. So there's an image coming up uh, showing the petition itself, and on here you can actually just see the signs of the signatories for the petition. The background for this work was made by jumping on and dancing on the canvas with a lot of earth involved. And the petition reads, Dear Sir, as our representative in the legislature, Assembly of this state, we the undersigned, beg to briefly put before you some of the annoying circumstances surrounding us in connection with the employment of Aborigines and would point out that our opinion is that so long as we are agreeable and anxious to act humanely and fairly with the blacks, we should not be hampered with restrictions such as we have been and are now subjected to. In regard to the payment of certain sums to the government for boys and gins, that's the term for Aboriginal women, employed whilst giving homes to these people who would otherwise be thrown on the state. 
We are of the opinion that the amount of wages should be left optional with the employers to be paid in accordance with the merit of the employee. Anyway, it goes on and basically they're saying they just don't want to pay uh, Aboriginal people who are on the, in, you know, working on these properties and they'd prefer to have white boys coming in of past school ages working there. And they're talking about Do Dr Roth, as in Walter Roth, also known as Walter Roth. And um, I've used his map, uh, which was very much part of this whole colonisation. And they're advising that um, reserves should be set aside for the blacks now wandering in the district and these reserves placed under police supervision guided by advice of local justices. So why I'm interested in this is because these are all the stations surrounding um, our country and, you know, they've got the signatures of all the people from those stations. So these are, this is the power and influence which um, basically pertained to my matrilineal family, my Aboriginal family. Thank you. Yeah, and I think um, maybe just kind of extending from this... You know, obviously these bodies of work um, are part of your broader practices. You know, these, these concerns and these interests are a part of your, your existing practices. And yet these works were commissioned by the National Gallery. And I'm keen to hear your thoughts, you know, about institutions like the National Gallery in a reconciliation context. Because, of course, museums are colonial structures. They're places that keep, acquire, classify objects which assign value to objects. Um, so I'm just kind of interested to know whether, you know, you think can they change, like can they be flexible or become flexible enough to encompass all of the kind of audiences they, they kind of seek to represent? It's a big question. Um, I mean, I feel like, I mean, a lot of the work that I made in this show started with this idea of foundations and the, the rot in the foundations in the colonial institutions. Um, and I think that, you know, that can be applied to museums as much as any other kind of institution, that there are these realities sitting in the collections of you know, dispossession and brutality and theft and all of it. Um, but I think, like, the, the complexities of that and maybe the impossibility of redressing that in an absolute way doesn't mean that you shouldn't attempt to do it. Um, I think... Um, you know, there are a lot of museums doing really important repatriation work and and that kind of thing and forming relationships with communities whose objects they have in their collections and that sort of thing. And I think, um, I mean, I was saying to you earlier, I think the, the rehang of Australian art upstairs here currently does some really important work in terms of what is brought into proximity with what other works. Mm -hmm. There's um, like a Fiona Foley work sharing space with a Tom Roberts painting. And, you know, I have this sense of those, you know, there's lots of instances in that show of works that have been waiting and calling to each other and have not been in physical proximity to each other until now. Mm -hmm. So I think things like that are important and, um, you know, making space for Indigenous curators and artists to come in and inhabit these spaces as they do in brilliant and beautiful ways, you know, currently in ceremony and in the Indigenous curatorial team here. So we, we have some amazing, amazing First Nations people on staff. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with the... Um, the current hang which is upstairs. I hope everybody's seen it and will go and see it. But just seeing, uh, I can almost imagine as the curators and installers have put the work together, those decisions of making, you know, putting one work against another and the spacing and everything else 
and mostly I agree with it. There's probably one thing I might, you know, but, but I can't even remember what that is. So it's something that I totally agree with and I've heard other artists and visitors say the same thing. And it's just so clever, uh, but also brings histories together and artists together, you know, like the, the works with Margaret Preston and then other contemporary artists and other uh, previous artists and sort of looking at appropriation. It's a very, very clever juxtaposition. And I, I really um, want to thank the National Gallery for bringing those works to our attention and um, encourage you all to see it for months and years ahead. Um, I note that it's already quarter to seven. Um, so maybe I'll ask one final question of you both and then we'll um, go to some audience questions. But um, when Cara and I were speaking, we really kind of wanted to know what is it that you want your work to do? What do you want audiences to kind of take away from it? Judy? Well, I'll bring that back into the institution a little bit too. Uh, so with the institutions, as an artist and a, you know, trying to do research and all the rest of it, I would like institutions to open up and allow the artists and other activists, art activists or whatever, to come in, um, open those gates, let, let them through. Uncle Sam Watson talked about how it was really important that the artists and musicians, the singers, everybody else were able to come in as he saw them as the bards and the seers, uh, bringing those messages, really important messages through into the future. So I think I, I would love to see these spaces open for you know generations to come uh, to really activate them and also to have disparate histories of work vying together. And I hope that, I think as we said at the beginning, that people will go away from this history uh, lesson, which I think this work is in a way, uh, wanting to know more about their own histories and look at that and challenge themselves and challenge everybody else and also go out and get involved with art, make work, have fun. I agree. I, I think um, my hope would be that people come away from experiencing that exhibition with questions and a willingness to sit with discomfort um, and incommensurability. I think that's an important aspect of the exhibition from my point of view, is just those, you know, bringing together our really different subject positions and going, sometimes they bring things out in each other and sometimes they're jarring to each other or their energies are really different. Mm -hmm. And that, that it doesn't mean you have to shut that down, you know, and take the, take the echo chamber approach. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it'd be great if people came away wanting to do their own digging. I think both of us do a lot of digging as part of our practices and encourage others to do likewise. And I mean, it's so important. I mean, I even think about when I went to school, high school, you know, I grew up in rural South Australia and I think we did one unit on Australian history in high school. Um, but I think that's changing. I mean, it seems to be changing. This seems to be like, I don't know if you agree, kind of an exciting moment mm. that does seem to be real change, not only in the art world, but I think, you know, socially, culturally, more broadly. So thank you to you both for, you know, drawing these kind of lesser known histories, these memories, whether, you know, they're personal, familial, archival, you know, to, to our attention. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left, so we might go to some audience questions. Um, so there are a couple here on the screen. Um, how did you bring your bodies of work together? And did you have a chance to see the works together before they were exhibited? Um, who wants to start? I'm happy to start. Sure. Um, so the works weren't physically in the same space until the install. Um, because of COVID, 
we were both like, there were occasions when we were like, oh, we can both like be in Sydney at the same time and we could meet in person and have a conversation mm. in, in the real, which is always preferable. But in, I, we never could get to each other's studios during the production of this work because of COVID. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, yeah, just physically bringing them into the space. Um, you know, for me, it was like, oh gosh, my works are like really massive and I feel self-conscious about that, but also that's what they are. Mm. Um, and yeah, what about yeah. you? We, well, we saw each other's work online a bit. It was like little tastes of it. It was like, yeah. I want to see more. And so to actually see it after just seeing little bits of it sort of in progress was great. And uh, yeah, I'm look look forward to seeing it in other spaces too. Yeah, I'm quite excited about that too. That it's it's um, this show's travelling to some different venues, and I'm I think it's going to be really nice to be able to iterate it in different ways and play with the relationships between the works in different spaces. As I said to you both though earlier, I will really miss the works. I've loved spending time with them and their works that reward because, um, you know, I think that's another one, something else that links your practices is that your art isn't easy. It's kind of, it's layered. Um, you described it earlier sort of as a, a palimpsest um, and you need to kind of spend time with it. And what I loved about this particular configuration, and as you say, it will change as the work kind of travels sort of around to different venues, but I loved that it was so immersive and that it kind of, um, it not only kind of implicated you in the kind of histories that it told, but it also kind of held you in a way. And I, I kind of loved that, so thank you. Um, there um, was another question here what I'm sorry what was it like as two artists with distinct practices to kind of work to work in this way I mean as we kind of said in the intro I mean you worked sort of remotely but you were kind of in conversation um, for for a long time what did you learn from each other I guess well I, I trained as a printmaker and I see the layering of printmaking uh, as something which I can almost read in, in Helen's work. It's almost like, you know, sort of with the layering and peeling back, yeah. it's almost like a reductive, you know, sort of print in a way too, where you sort of start and then you pull it back and pull it back. Um, so it's something that doesn't feel like it's very different to what I do in some ways. I can understand that layering and that attention to detail, even though that's not necessarily the way uh, that I make the work. Yeah, I I feel the same. I um. I mean, I've been a fan of Judy's practice for many years, um, and really, um, interested in the way. I think there are like lots of similarities in our works in like basic material senses of working unstretched and working on the floor, which is like a practical necessity for me, um, and working with these different registers of image that intersect and intervene on each other as well. Um, and I think that having those, having certain similarities like that, but then seeing how they produce these really different outcomes is, is a really interesting part of the process for me. Yeah. Yeah, I think as artists, there's always, um, something about meeting together in terms of materiality and trying to understand and also being very receptive to or seduced by that materiality. So I've, you know, really enjoyed seeing that within your work. Likewise, that was, that was like the one thing we can thank COVID for was like having that, all those tantalising images from a distance on the screen and then being able to like be with the work physically and see all of the nuances in the surfaces of your works and the details and the coherency of them as well was really such a lovely thing when we finally made it up here. There's another question here. Um, as a primary school teacher, so I assume this 
question is from a primary school teacher. What would you like children to know about art? And I guess I would extend that question a little bit, not only about art, but kind of the stories that you're, you're telling. Well, I think there's been um, a project developed which is Art Steps with the National Gallery. And so I think both of us would love to see children be very playful and go through some of the layering processes that we have gone through but find their own way. But really, it's very much about being playful and not being too constricted and relating that perhaps to your immediate environment and we were looking at plants and things like that, thinking about the plants for people who are local here can walk around and maybe even see around the National Gallery with the plantings or wherever the, the students are based. And that's one thing, but there's so many other things. I mean, you know, sort of there's maps in my work. Primary school teacher, show your children um, what's the Aboriginal country they're on, let them talk about that, maybe let them do mapping of how they get to school. There's so many ways that they can learn about um, who they are and where they fit. I agree. Um, I also, I think I, I'd i like children to know about art, that it's, um, that they don't have to, um, there's no right or wrong when it comes to art, that art can be a question or art can just be an exploration, um, that there doesn't have to be like a, a fixed meaning and that there's not, you know, when you encounter an artwork, what emerges is between you and the work and it's different for every person. Yeah. And I found primary school students are the best in terms of asking them, well, what do you think about this? And instead of being told by the teacher, they'll tell you straight what it is. And it's so honest and so wonderful. And I really hope that they are allowed to keep that wonder and honesty going. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's always such a pleasure to listen to you both. Um, as I said, you're artists, you know, who I am sure we all deeply admire. Your work so intelligent and important, I think, particularly at this moment in time of, of reckoning, you know, and everything that's kind of happening sort of culturally um, in this country or rather series of, of, of First Nations countries. So um, thank you to you both. As uh, you've already indicated, the work will be travelling to a number of galleries sort of all across Australia. First up will be NAM or, or, or Melbourne at MUMA. So really looking forward to seeing the work there too. Um, so will you join me in thanking Judy and Helen? Oh. And before, yeah. happy birthday to Cara. Oh, happy birthday to Cara. <laughs> OK, can everyone sing along? <laughs> happy birthday, birthday to you. Cara. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, <laughs> dear Cara. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Hooray! <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you.